Hi everyone, this is Robert. Welcome to The Well Told Tale. Every week we bring to life the greatest science fiction and fantasy stories ever written. The Well Told Tale is now available as both a podcast and on YouTube, as well as being available early for my patrons every week over on patreon.com. There's a link in the description if you're interested in that, or getting access to some stories I record just for my patrons. Today, we continue with The Invisible Man by H.G. Wells. Our protagonist, the Invisible Man himself, has taken to the small village of Iping. He is invisible, but does not want to be. He's trying desperately to find a chemical cure with little success, and he has had to resort to stealing money to survive. He has muffled himself up with a large overcoat, bandages and a fake nose to allay suspicion, but that disguise is wearing thin. The question now is how long can this carry on? How long can the Invisible Man stay invisible before people find out who or what he is? So, pull up a chair, relax and enjoy part two of The Invisible Man by H.G. Wells. Chapter 6. The Furniture That Went Mad Now it happened that in the early hours of Whit Monday, before Millie was hunted out for the day, Mr. Hall and Mrs. Hall both rose and went noiselessly down into the cellar. Their business there was of a private nature, and had something to do with the specific gravity of their beer, they had hardly entered the cellar when Mrs. Hall found she had forgotten to bring down a bottle of sarsaparilla from their joint room. As she was the expert and principal operator in this affair, Hall very properly went upstairs for it. On the landing, he was surprised to see that the stranger's door was ajar. He went on into his own room and found the bottle as he had been directed, but returning with the bottle, he noticed that the bolts of the front door had been shot back, that the door was in fact simply on the latch and with a flash of inspiration he connected this with the stranger's room upstairs and the suggestions of Mr. Teddy Henfrey. He distinctly remembered holding the candle while Mrs. Hall shot those bolts overnight. At the sight he stopped, gaping, then with the bottle still in his hand went upstairs again. He rapped at the stranger's door. There was no answer. He rapped again, then pushed the door wide open and entered. It was as he expected. The bed, the room also, was empty. And what was stranger, even to his heavy intelligence, on the bedroom chair and along the rail of the bed were scattered the garments, the only garments so far as he knew, and the bandages of their guest. His big slouch hat even was cocked jauntily over the bedpost. As Hall stood there, he heard his wife's voice coming out of the depths of the cellar, with that rapid telescoping of the syllables and interrogative cocking up of the final words to a high note, by which the West Sussex villager is wont to indicate a brisk impatience. George, you got what a one? At that, he turned and hurried down to her. Janny, he said over the rail of the cellar stairs, tells the truth what Henry says. He's not in his room, he ain't, and the front door's unbolted. At first, Mrs. Hall did not understand, and as soon as she did, she resolved to see the empty room for herself. Hall, still holding the bottle, went first. "'If he ain't there,' he said, "'is close, are. "'And what's he doing without his clothes, then? "'Tis a most curious business.' As they came up the cellar steps, they both, it was afterwards ascertained, fancied they heard the front door open and shut, but seeing it closed and nothing there, neither said a word to the other about it at the time. Mrs. Hall passed her husband in the passage and ran on first upstairs. Someone sneezed on the staircase. Hall, following six steps behind, thought he had heard her sneeze. She, going on first, was under the impression that Hall was sneezing. She flung open the door and stood regarding the room. "'Of all the curious,' she said. She heard a sniff close behind her head, as it seemed, and, turning, was surprised to see Hall a dozen feet off on the topmost stair. But in another moment he was beside her. She bent forward and put her hand on the pillow, then under the clothes. Cold, she said. He's been up this hour or more. And as she did so, a most extraordinary thing happened. 
The bedclothes gathered themselves together, leapt up suddenly into a sort of peak, and then jumped headlong over the bottom rail. It was exactly as if a hand had clutched them in the centre and flung them aside. Immediately after, the stranger's hat hopped off the bedpost, described a whirling flight in the air through a better part of a circle, and then dashed straight at Mrs Hall's face. Then as swiftly came the sponge from the washstand, and then the chair, flinging the stranger's coat and trousers carelessly aside, and laughing, dryly in a voice singularly like the stranger's, turned itself up with its four legs at Mrs Hall, seemed to take aim at her for a moment, and charged at her. She screamed and turned, and then the chair legs came gently but firmly against her back and impelled her and Hall out of the room. The door slammed violently and was locked. The chair and bed seemed to be executing a dance of triumph for a moment, and then abruptly everything was still. Mrs Hall was left almost in a fainting condition in Mr Hall's arms on the landing. It was with the greatest difficulty that Mr Hall and Millie, who had been roused by her scream of alarm, succeeded in getting her downstairs and applying the restoratives customary in such cases. "'Tas spirits,' said Mrs Hall. "'I know tas spirits. I've read in papers of them, tables and chairs, leaping and dancing.' "'Take a drop more, Janny,' said Hall. "'Twill steady you. "'Lock him out!' said Mrs. Hall. "'Don't let him come back in again. "'I half guests I might have known, "'with them goggling eyes and bandaged head "'and never going to a church of a Sunday, "'and all they bottles, "'more than it's right to any one person to have. "'He's put the spirits into the furniture, "'my good old furniture. "'Twas in that very chair my poor dear mother used to sit "'when I was a little girl. "'To think it should rise up against me now.' "'Just a drop more, Jenny,' said Hall. "'Your nerves is all upset.' They sent Millie across the street through the golden five o'clock sunshine to rouse up Mr Sandy Wadgers, the blacksmith. Mr Hall's compliments and the furniture upstairs was behaving most extraordinary. Would Mr Wadgers come round? He was a knowing man, was Mr Wadgers, and very resourceful. He took quite a grave view of the case. I'm darned of that and witchcraft, was the view of Mr Sandy Wadgers. You aren't horseshoes for such gentry as he. He came round greatly concerned. They wanted him to lead the way upstairs to the room, but he didn't seem to be in any hurry. He preferred to talk in the passage. Over the way, Huxter's apprentice came out and began taking down the shutters of the tobacco window. He was called over to join the discussion. Mr Huxter naturally followed over in the course of a few minutes. The Anglo-Saxon genius for parliamentary government asserted itself. There was a great deal of talk and no decisive action. "'Let's have the facts first, insisted Mr Sandy Wedges. "'Let's be sure we'd be acting perfectly right in busting that there door open. "'A door on bust is always open to bustin', "'but you can unbust a door once you've busted un.' "'And suddenly, and most wonderfully, "'the door of the room upstairs opened of its own accord, "'and as they looked up in amazement, "'they saw descending the stairs the muffled figure of the stranger, "'staring more blackly and blankly than ever, "'with those unreasonably large blue glass eyes of his. "'He came down stiffly and slowly, staring all the time. "'He walked across the passage, staring, then stopped. "'Look there,' he said and their eyes followed the direction of his gloved finger and saw a bottle of sarsaparilla hard by the cellar door. Then he entered the parlour and suddenly, swiftly, viciously slammed the door in their faces. Not a word was spoken until the last echoes of the slam had died away. They stared at one another. Well, if that don't look everything, said Mr Wadges, and left the alternative unsaid. I go in and ask about it, said Wedges to Mr Hall. I demand an explanation. It took some time to bring the landlady's husband up to that pitch. At last he rapped, opened the door and got as far as... Excuse me? Go to the devil, said the stranger in a tremendous voice, and shut that door after you. So that brief interview terminated. Chapter 7. The Unveiling of the Stranger the stranger went into the little parlour of the coach and horses about half past five in the morning, and there he remained until near midday, the blinds down, the door shut, and none, after Hall's repulse, venturing near him. 
All that time he must have fasted. Thrice he rang his bell, the third time furiously and continuously, but no one answered him. "'Him and his go to the devil indeed,' said Mrs. Hall. Presently came an imperfect rumour of the burglary at the vicarage, and two and two were put together. Hall, assisted by Wadgers, went off to find Mr. Shuckleforth, the magistrate, and take his advice. No one ventured upstairs. How the stranger occupied himself is unknown. Now and then he would stride violently up and down, and twice came an outburst of curses, a tearing of paper, and a violent smashing of bottles. The little group of scared but curious people increased. Mrs. Huckster came over, some gay young fellows resplendent in black ready-made jackets and piquet paper ties, for it was Whit Monday, joined the group with confused interrogations. Young Archie Harker distinguished himself by going up the yard and trying to peep under the window blinds. He could see nothing, but gave reason for supposing that he did, and others of the Iping youth presently joined him. It was the finest of all possible Whit Mondays, and down the village street stood a row of nearly a dozen booths, a shooting gallery, and on the grass by the forge were three yellow and chocolate wagons, and some picturesque strangers of both sexes putting up a coconut shy. The gentlemen wore blue jerseys, the ladies white aprons, and quite fashionable hats with heavy plumes. Wadger, of the purple fawn, and Mr Jaggers, the cobbler, were also sold old second-hand ordinary bicycles, were stretching a string of Union Jacks and Royal Ensigns, which had originally celebrated the first Victorian Jubilee, across the road. And inside, in the artificial darkness of the parlour, into which only one thin jet of sunlight penetrated, the stranger, hungry we must suppose, and fearful, hidden in his uncomfortable hot wrappings, poured through his dark glasses upon his paper, or chinked his dirty little bottles, and occasionally swore savagely at the boys, audible if invisible, outside the windows. In the corner by the fireplace lay the fragments of half a dozen smashed bottles, and a pungent twang of chlorine tainted the air. So much we know from what was heard at the time and from what was subsequently seen in the room. About noon he suddenly opened his parlour door and stood glaring fixedly at the three or four people in the bar. "'Mrs. Hall!' he said. Somebody went sheepishly and called for Mrs. Hall. Mrs. Hall appeared after an interval, a little short of breath, but all the fiercer for that. Hall was still out. She had deliberated over the scene, and she came holding a little tray with an unsettled bill upon it. "'Is it your bill you're wanting, sir?' she said. "'Why wasn't my breakfast laid? Why haven't you prepared my meals and answered my bell? Do you think I live without eating?' "'Why isn't my bill paid?' said Mrs. Hall. "'That's what I want to know.' "'I told you three days ago I was awaiting a remittance. "'I told you two days ago I wasn't going to await no remittances. "'You can't grumble if your breakfast waits a bit "'if my bill's been waiting those five days, can you?' "'The stranger swore briefly but vividly. "'Nah, nah,' from the bar. "'And I thank you kindly, sir, if you keep your swearing to yourself, sir,' said Mrs. Hall. The stranger stood looking more like an angry diving helmet than ever. It was universally felt in the bar that Mrs. Hall had the better of him. His next words showed as much. "'Look here, my good woman,' he began. "'Don't good woman me,' said Mrs. Hall. "'I've told you my remittance hasn't come.' "'Remittance indeed,' said Mrs. Hall. "'Still, I dare say in my pocket. "'You told me three days ago that you hadn't anything but a sovereign's worth of silver upon you. "'Well,' I found some more. Hello, from the bar. I wonder where you found it, said Mrs. Hall. That seemed to annoy the stranger very much. He stamped his foot. What do you mean? he said. That I wonder where you found it, said Mrs. Hall, and before I take any bills or get any breakfasts or do any such things whatsoever, you've got to tell me one or two things I don't understand and what nobody don't understand and what everybody is anxious to understand. I want to know what you've been doing to my chair upstairs, and I want to know how tis your room was empty and how you got in again. Them as stops in this house comes in by the doors. That's the rule of the house, and that you didn't do. And what I want to know... It's how you did come in. And I want to know... Suddenly the stranger raised his gloved hands, clenched, stamped his foot and said, Stop! With such extraordinary violence, he silenced her instantly. You don't understand, he said, who I am or what I am. I'll show you. By heaven, I'll show you. Then 
he put his open palm over his face and withdrew it. The centre of his face became a black cavity. Here, he said. He stepped forward and handed Mrs Hall something which she, staring at his metamorphosed face, accepted automatically. Then, when she saw what it was, she screamed loudly, dropped it and staggered back. The nose. It was the stranger's nose, pink and shiny, rolled on the floor. Then he removed his spectacles, and everyone in the bar gasped. He took off his hat and, with a violent gesture, tore at his whiskers and bandages. For a moment they resisted him. A flash of horrible anticipation passed through the bar. "'Oh, my God!' said someone. Then off they came. It was worse than anything. Mrs Hall, standing open-mouthed and horror-struck, shrieked at what she saw and made for the door of the house. Everyone began to move. They were prepared for scars, disfigurements, tangible horrors. But nothing... The bandages and false hair flew across the passage into the bar, making a hobbledy-hoy jump to avoid them. Everyone tumbled on everyone else down the stairs, for the man who stood there shouting some incoherent explanation was a solid, gesticulating figure up to the coat collar of him, and then nothingness, no visible thing at all. People down the village heard shouts and shrieks, and looking up the street saw the coach and horses violently firing out its humanity. They saw Mrs Hall fall down, and Mr Teddy Henfrey jump to avoid tumbling over her, and then they heard the frightful screams of Millie, who, emerging suddenly from the kitchen at the noise of the tumult, had come upon the headless stranger from behind. These increased suddenly. Forthwith, everyone, all down the street, the sweet stuff seller, coconut shy proprietor and his assistant, the swing man, little boys and girls, rustic dandies, smart wenches, smocked elders and aproned gypsies began running towards the inn. And in a miraculously short space of time, a crowd of perhaps forty people, and rapidly increasing, swayed and hooted and inquired and exclaimed and suggested in front of Mrs. Hall's establishment. Everyone seemed eager to talk at once, and the result was Babel. A small group supported Mrs Hall, who was picked up in a state of collapse. There was a conference and the incredible evidence of a vociferous eyewitness. Oh, bogey! What's he been doing then? Ain't hurt the girl, has he? Run at him with a knife, I believe. No, Ed, I tell ye, I don't mean no manner of speaking. I meant man without a head. "'Nonsense! Tis some gundering trick! Fetched off his wrapping, he did!' In its struggles to see in through the open door, the crowd formed itself into a straggling wedge, with the more adventurous apex near the inn. He stood for a moment, I heard the gal scream, and then he turned. I heard her skirts whisk, and he went after her. Didn't take ten seconds. Back he comes with a knife in his hand and a loaf, stood just as if he was staring. Not a moment ago. Went in that there door, I tell you. He ain't got no head at all. You just missed him. There was a disturbance behind, and the speaker stopped to step aside for a little procession that was marching very resolutely towards the door. First Mr Hall, very red and determined, then Mr Bobby Jaffers, the village constable, and then the wary Mr Wadgers. They had come now armed with a warrant. People shouted conflicting information of the recent circumstances. Ed or no Ed, said Jaffers, I got a restin, and restin I will. Mr Hall marched up the steps, marched straight to the door of the parlour and flung it open. Constable, do your duty. Jaffers marched in, Hall next, Wadgers last. They saw in the dim light the headless figure facing them with a gnawed crust of bread in one hand and a chunk of cheese in the other. That's him, said Hall. What the devil's this? came in a tone of angry expostulation from above the colour of the figure. "'You're a damned rum customer, mister,' said Mr Jeffers, "'but, Ed or no Ed, the warrant says body, and duty's duty.' "'Keep off!' said the figure, starting back. Abruptly he whipped down the bread and cheese, and Mr Hall just grasped the knife on the table in time to save it. Off came the stranger's left glove, and it was slapped in Jeffers' face. In another moment, Jaffers, cutting some short statement concerning a warrant, had gripped him by the handless wrist and caught his invisible throat. He got a sound kick on the shin that made him shout, but he kept his grip. 
Hall sent the knife sliding along the table to Wadgers, who acted as a goalkeeper for the offensive, so to speak, and then stepped forward as Jaffers and the stranger swayed and staggered towards him, clutching and hitting in. A chair stood in the way and went aside with a crash as they came down together. "'Get the feet!' said Jaffers between his teeth. Mr Hall, endeavouring to act on instructions, received a sounding kick in the ribs that disposed of him for a moment, and Mr Wadgers, seeing the decapitated stranger had rolled over and got the upper side of Jaffers, retreated towards the door, knife in hand, and so collided with Mr Huckster and the Siderbridge Carter coming to the rescue of law and order. At the same moment, down came three or four bottles from the chiffonnier and shot a web of pungency into the air of the room. "'I'll surrender!' cried the stranger, though he had Jaffers down, and in another moment he stood up panting, a strange figure, headless and handless, for he had pulled off his right glove now as well as his left. "'It's no good,' he said, as if sobbing for breath. It was the strangest thing in the world to hear that voice coming as if out of empty space, but the Sussex peasants are perhaps the most matter-of-fact people under the sun. Jaffers got up also and produced a pair of handcuffs. Then he stared. "'I say,' said Jaffers, brought up short by a dim realisation of the incongruity of the whole business. "'Darn it! Can't use em, as I can't see!' The stranger ran his arm down his waistcoat, and, as if by a miracle, the buttons to which his empty sleeve pointed became undone. Then he said something about his shin and stooped down. He seemed to be fumbling with his shoes and socks. "'Why?' said Huckster suddenly. "'That's not a man at all. It's just empty clothes. Look, you can see down his collar and the linings of his clothes. I could put my arm—' He extended his hand— it seemed to meet something in mid-air, and he drew it back with a sharp exclamation. "'I wish you'd keep your fingers out of my eye,' said the aerial voice in a tone of savage expostulation. "'The fact is, I'm all here, head, hands, legs, and all the rest of it. But it happens I'm invisible. It's a confounded nuisance, but I am. That's no reason why I should be poked to pieces by every stupid bumpkin in Iping, is it?' The suit of clothes, now all unbuttoned and hanging loosely upon its unseen supports, stood up, arms akimbo. Several other of the menfolk had now entered the room, so that it was closely crowded. "'Invisible, eh?' said Huckster, ignoring the stranger's abuse. "'Whoever heard the likes of that?' "'It's strange, perhaps, but it's not a crime. Why am I assaulted by a policeman in this fashion?' "'Ah, that's a different matter,' said Jaffers. "'No doubt you're a bit difficult to see in this light, but I've got a warrant and it's all correct. "'What I'm after ain't no invisibility. It's burglary. "'There's a house been broken into and money took. "'Well, and circumstances certainly point stuff and nonsense,' said the invisible man. "'I hope so, sir, but I've got my instructions.' "'Well,' said the stranger, "'I'll come, I'll come, but no handcuffs.' "'It's the regular thing,' said Jaffers. "'No handcuffs,' stipulated the stranger. "'Pardon me,' said Jaffers. Abruptly, the figure sat down, and before anyone could realise what was being done, the slippers, socks and trousers had been kicked off under the table. Then he sprang up again and flung off his coat. "'Here, stop that!' said Jaffers, suddenly realising what was happening. He gripped at the waistcoat, it struggled, and the shirt slipped out of it and left it limp in his hand. "'Hold him!' said Jaffers loudly. "'Once he gets the things off!' "'Hold him!' cried everyone, and there was a rush at the fluttering white shirt, which was now all that was visible of the stranger. The shirt sleeve planted a shrewd blow in Hall's face that stopped his open-armed advance and sent him backward into old Toothsome the sexton, and in another moment the garment was lifted up and became convulsed and vacantly flapping about the arms, even as the shirt that is being thrust over a man's head. Jaffers clutched at it, and it only helped to pull it off. He was struck in the mouth out of the air, and incontinently threw his truncheon and smote Teddy Henfrey savagely upon the crown of his head. "'Look out!' said everybody, fencing at random and hitting at nothing. "'Hold him! Shut the door! Don't let him loose! I've got something! Here it is!' Perfect babel of noise they made. Everybody, it seemed, was being hit all at once. And Sandy Wadges, knowing as ever, and his wits sharpened by a frightful blow in the nose, reopened the door and led the rout. The others followed incontinently, were jammed for a moment in the corner by the doorway. The hitting continued. Phipps, the Unitarian, had a front tooth broken, and Henfrey was injured in the cartilage of his ear. 
Jaffers was struck under the jaw, and turning caught at something that intervened between him and Huckster in the melee, and prevented their coming together. He felt a muscular chest, and in another moment the whole mass of struggling, excited men shot out into the crowded hall. "'I got him!' shouted Jaffers, choking and reeling through them all and wrestling with purple face and swelling veins against his unseen enemy. Men staggered right and left as the extraordinary conflict swayed swiftly towards the house door and went spinning down the half-dozen steps of the inn. Jaffers cried in a strangled voice, holding tight nevertheless and making play with his knee, spun around and heavily undermost with his head on the ground. Only then did his fingers relax. There were excited cries of, Hold him! Invisible! and so forth, and a young man, a stranger in the place whose name did not come to light, rushed in at once, caught something, missed his hold, and fell over the constable's prostrate body. Halfway across the road, a woman screamed as if something pushed by her. A dog kicked, apparently yelped, and ran howling into Huckster's yard. And with that, the transit of the invisible man was accomplished. For a space... People stood amazed and gesticulating, and then came panic, and scattered them abroad through the village as a gust scatters dead leaves. But Jaffers lay quite still, face upward and knees bent, at the foot of the steps of the inn. Chapter 8. In Transit the eighth chapter is exceedingly brief, and relates that Gibbons, the amateur naturalist of the district, while lying out on the spacious open downs without a soul within a couple of miles of him as he thought, and almost dozing, heard close to him the sound as of a man coughing, sneezing, and then swearing savagely to himself, and looking beheld nothing. Yet the voice was indisputable. It continued to swear with that breadth and variety that distinguishes the swearing of a cultivated man. It grew to a climax, diminished again, and died away in the distance, going, as it seemed to him, in the direction of Adderdean. It lifted to a spasmodic sneeze and ended. Gibbons had heard nothing of the morning's occurrences, but the phenomenon was so striking and disturbing that his philosophical tranquillity vanished. He got up hastily and hurried down the steepness of the hill towards the village as fast as he could go. Chapter 9. Mr Thomas Marvel You must picture Mr Thomas Marvel as a person of copious, flexible visage, a nose of cylindrical protrusion, a licorice, ample, fluctuating mouth, and a beard of bristling eccentricity. His figure inclined to embonpoint. His short limbs accentuated this inclination. He wore a furry silk hat, and the frequent substitution of twine and shoelaces for buttons, apparent at critical points of his costume, marked a man essentially bachelor. Mr Thomas Marvel was sitting with his feet in a ditch by the roadside over the down towards Adderdean, about a mile and a half out of Iping. His feet, save for socks of irregular open work, were bare. His big toes were broad and pricked like the ears of a watchful dog. In a leisurely manner, he did everything in a leisurely manner. He was contemplating trying on a new pair of boots. They were the soundest boots he had come across for a long time, but too large for him, whereas the ones he had were, in dry weather, a very comfortable fit, but too thin-soled for damp. Mr Thomas Marvel hated roomy shoes, but then he hated damp. He had never properly thought out which he hated most, and it was a pleasant day, and there was nothing better to do, so he put the four shoes in a graceful group on the turf and looked at them. And seeing them there among the grass and springing agrimony, it suddenly occurred to him that both pairs were exceedingly ugly to see. He was not at all startled by a voice behind him. "'They're boots, anyhow,' said the voice. "'They are charity boots,' said Mr Thomas Marvel, with his head on one side, regarding them distastefully. And which is the ugliest pair in the whole blessed universe? I'm darned if I know. Hmm, said the voice. I've worn worse. In fact, I've worn none. But none so audacious ugly, if you'll allow the expression. I've been cadging boots in particular for days, because I was sick of them. They're sound enough, of course, but a gentleman on tramp sees such a thundering lot of his boots... And, if you'll believe me, I've raised nothing in the whole blessed country, try as I would, but them. Look at them. 
and a good country for boots too, in a general way, but it's just my promiscuous luck. I've got my boots in this country ten years or more, and then they treat you like this. It's a beast of a country, said the voice, and pigs for people. Ain't it, said Mr Thomas Marvel. Lord, but them boots, it beats it. He turned his head over his shoulder to the right to look at the boots of his interlocutor with a view to comparisons, and lo, where the boots of his interlocutor should have been were neither legs nor boots. He was irradiated by the dawn of a great amazement. Where are you? said Mr Thomas Marvel over his shoulder and coming on all fours. He saw a stretch of empty downs with the wind swaying the remote green-pointed firs bushes. Am I drunk? said Mr Marvel. Have I had visions? Was I talking to myself? What the... Don't be alarmed, said a voice. None of your ventriloquizing me, said Mr Thomas Marvel, rising sharply to his feet. Where are you? Alarmed indeed. Don't be alarmed, repeated the voice. You'll be alarmed in a minute, you silly fool, said Thomas Marvel. Where are you? Let me get my mark on you. Are you buried? said Mr. Thomas Marvel after an interval. There was no answer. Mr. Thomas Marvel stood bootless and amazed, his jacket nearly thrown off. Peewit, said a peewit, very remote. Peewit indeed, said Mr. Thomas Marvel. This ain't no time for foolery. The down was desolate, east and west, north and south. The road with its shallow ditches and white bordering stakes ran smooth and empty north and south, and save for that peewit, the blue sky was empty too. So help me, said Mr Thomas Marvel, shuffling his coat onto his shoulders again. It's the drink, I might have known. It's not the drink, said the voice. You keep your nerves steady. Ow! said Mr. Marvel, and his face grew white amidst its patches. It's the drink! His lips repeated noiselessly. He remained staring about him, rotating slowly backwards. I could have swore I heard a voice, he whispered. Of course you did. It's there again, said Mr. Marvel, closing his eyes and clasping his hand on his brow in a tragic gesture. He was suddenly taken by the collar and shaken violently, and left more dazed than ever. Don't be a fool, said the voice. I'm off my blooming chump, said Mr. Marvel. It's no good. It's fretting about them blasted boots. I'm off my blessed blooming chump. Or it's spirits. Neither one thing nor the other, said the voice. Listen. Chump, said Mr. Marvel. One minute, said the voice, penetrating, tremulous with self-control. Well, said Mr. Thomas Marvel, with a strange feeling of having been dug in the chest by a finger. You think I'm just imagination, just imagination. What else can you be, said Mr. Thomas Marvel, rubbing the back of his neck. Very well, said the voice in a tone of relief. Then I'm going to throw flints at you until you think differently. But where are you? The voice made no answer. Whiz came a flint, apparently out of the air, and missed Mr. Marvel's shoulder by a hair's breadth. Mr. Marvel, turning, saw a flint jerk up into the air, trace a complicated path, hang for a moment, and then fling at his feet with an almost invisible rapidity. He was too amazed to dodge. Whiz it came, and ricocheted from a bare toe into the ditch. Mr. Thomas Marvel jumped a foot and howled aloud. Then he started to run, tripped over an unseen obstacle, and came head over heels into a sitting position. Now said the voice, as a third stone curved upwards and hung in the air above the tramp. Am I imagination? Mr. Marvel, by way of reply, struggled to his feet and was immediately rolled over again. He lay quiet for a moment. If you struggle any more, said the voice, I shall throw the flint at your head. It's a fair do, said Mr. Thomas Marvel, sitting up, taking his wounded toe in hand and fixing his eye on the third missile. I don't understand it. Stones flinging themselves, stones talking. Put yourself down, rot away. I'm done. The third flint fell. It's very simple, said the voice. I'm an invisible man. Tell us something I don't know, said Mr. Marvel, gasping with pain. Where you've hid, how you did it, I, I don't know. I'm beat. That's all, said the voice. I'm invisible. That's what I want you to understand. Anyone could see that. There's no need for you to be so confounded impatient, mister. Now then, give us a notion. Where are you hid? I'm invisible. 
And that's the great point. And what I want you to understand is this. But whereabouts? interrupted Mr. Marvel. Here, six feet in front of you. Oh, come on. I'm not blind. You'll be telling me next you're just thin air. I'm not one of your ignorant tramps. Yes, I am. Thin air. You're looking through me. What? Ain't there any stuff to you? Voxet, what is it, Jabber? Is that it? I'm just a human being, solid, needing food and drink, needing covering too, but I'm invisible, you see? Invisible. Simple idea. Invisible. What? Real, like? Yes, real. Let's have a hand of you, said Marvel. If you are real... It won't be so darn out of the way, Len. Lord, he said, how you made me jump, gripping me like that. He felt the hand that had closed round his wrist with disengaged fingers, and his fingers went timorously up the arm, patted a muscular chest and explored a bearded face. Marvel's face was astonishment. I'm dashed, he said, if this don't beat cockfighting. Most remarkable. And there I can see a rabbit clean through you, half a mile away. Not a bit of you visible, except... He scrutinised the apparently empty space keenly. "'You haven't been eating bread and cheese?' he asked, holding the invisible arm. "'You're quite right, and it's not quite assimilated into the system.' "'Ah,' said Mr Marvel, "'sort of ghostly, then. "'Of course all this isn't half so wonderful as you think. "'It's quite wonderful enough for my modest wants,' said Mr Thomas Marvel. "'How'd you manage it? "'How the deuce is it done?' It's too long a story, and besides, I tell you, the whole business fairly beats me, said Mr Marvel. What I want to say at present is this. I need help. I have come to that. I came upon you suddenly. I was wandering, mad with rage, naked, impotent. I could have murdered, and I saw you. Lord, said Mr Marvel. I came up behind you, hesitated, went on. Mr Marvel's expression was eloquent. Then stopped. Here, I said, is an outcast like myself. This is a man for me. So I turned back and came to you. You. And... Lord, said Mr Marvel, but I'm all in a tizzy. Uh, May I ask, uh, how is it? And what you may be requiring in the way of help? Invisible! I want you to help me get clothes and shelter, and then with other things. I've left them long enough. If you won't, well... "'But you will. Must.' "'Look here,' said Mr. Marvel. "'I'm too flabbergasted. Don't knock me about any more, and leave me go. I must get steady a bit. "'And you've pretty near broken my toe. It's all so unreasonable. "'Empty downs, empty sky, nothing visible for miles except the bosom of nature. "'And then comes a voice, a voice out of heaven, and stones, and a fist. "'Lord!' "'Pull yourself together,' said the voice, "'for you have a job to do, the job I've chosen for you.' Mr Marvel blew out his cheeks and his eyes were round. "'I've chosen you,' said the voice. "'You are the only man except some of those fools down there "'who knows there is such a thing as an invisible man. "'You have to be my helper. Help me, and I will do great things for you. "'An invisible man is a man of power.' He stopped for a moment to sneeze violently. But if you betray me, he said, if you fail to do as I direct you... He paused and tapped Mr Marvel's shoulder smartly. Mr Marvel gave a yelp of terror at the touch. I don't want to betray you, said Mr Marvel, edging away from the direction of the fingers. Don't you go a-thinking that, whatever you do. All I want to do is help you. Just tell me what I've got to do. Lord, whatever you want done, that I'm most willing to do. Chapter 10. Mr. Marvel's Visit to Iping After the first gusty panic had spent itself, Iping became argumentative. Scepticism suddenly reared its head. Rather nervous scepticism, not at all assured of its back, but scepticism nevertheless. It is so much easier not to believe in an invisible man, and those who had actually seen him dissolve into air or felt the strength of his arm could be counted on the fingers of two hands. And of these witnesses, Mr. Wadgers was presently missing, having retired impregnably behind the bolts and bars of his own house, and Jaffers was lying stunned in the parlour of the coach and horses. 
Great and strange ideas transcending experience often have less effect upon men and women than smaller, more tangible considerations. Iping was gay and bunting, and everybody was in gala dress. Whit Monday had been looked forward to for a month or more. By the afternoon, even those who believed in the unseen were beginning to resume their little amusements in a tentative fashion, on the supposition that he had quite gone away, and with the sceptics he was already a jest. But people, sceptics and believers alike, were remarkably sociable all that day. Hazeman's meadow was gay with a tent, in which Mrs Bunting and other ladies were preparing tea, while without, the Sunday school children ran races and played games under the noisy guidance of the curate and the Mrs Cuss and Sackbutt. No doubt there was a slight uneasiness in the air, but people for the most part had the sense to conceal whatever imaginative qualms they experienced. On the village green, an inclined strong rope, down which, clinging the while to a pulley-swung handle one could be hurled violently against a sack at the other end, came in for considerable favour among the adolescents, and also did the swings and the coconut shies. There was also promenading, and the steam organ attached to a small roundabout filled the air with a pungent flavour of oil, and with equally pungent music. Members of the club, who had attended church in the morning, were splendid in badges of pink and green, and some of the gayer-minded had also adorned their bowler hats with brilliant coloured favours of ribbon. Old Fletcher, whose conceptions of holiday-making were severe, was visible through the jasmine about his window or through the open door, whichever way you chose to look, poised delicately on a plank supported by two chairs and whitewashing the ceiling of his front room. About four o'clock, a stranger entered the village from the direction of the Downs. He was a short, stout person in an extraordinary shabby top hat, and he appeared to be very much out of breath. His cheeks were alternately limp and tightly puffed. His mottled face was apprehensive, and he moved with a sort of reluctant alacrity. He turned the corner of the church and directed his way to the coach and horses. Among others, old Fletcher remembers seeing him, and indeed the old gentleman was so struck by his peculiar agitation that he inadvertently allowed a quantity of whitewash to run down the brush into the sleeves of his coat while regarding him. This stranger, to the perceptions of the proprietor of the coconut shy, appeared to be talking to himself, and Mr Huckster remarked the same thing. He stopped at the foot of the coach and horse's steps, and according to Mr Huckster, appeared to undergo a severe internal struggle before he could induce himself to enter the house. Finally, he marched up the steps and was seen by Mr Huckster to turn to the left and open the door of the parlour. Mr Huckster heard voices from within the room and from the bar apprising the man of his error. "'That room's private,' said Hall, and the stranger shut the door clumsily and went into the bar. In the course of a few minutes he reappeared, wiping his lips with the back of his hand and an air of quiet satisfaction that somehow impressed Mr Huckster as assumed. He stood looking about him for some moments, and then Mr Huckster saw him walk in an oddly furtive manner towards the gates of the yard, upon which the parlour window opened. The stranger, after some hesitation, leant against one of the gateposts, produced a short clay pipe, and prepared to fill it. His fingers trembled while doing so. He lit it clumsily, and, folding his arms, began to smoke in a languid attitude, an attitude which his occasional glances up the yard altogether belied. All this Mr Huckster saw over the canisters of the tobacco window, and the singularity of the man's behaviour prompted him to maintain his observation. Presently the stranger stood up abruptly and put his pipe in his pocket. Then he vanished into the yard. Forthwith, Mr Huckster, conceiving he was witness of some petty larceny, leapt round his counter and ran out into the road to intercept the thief. As he did so, Mr Marvel reappeared, his hat askew, a big bundle in a blue tablecloth in one hand, and three books tied together, as it proved afterwards with the vicar's braces in the other. Directly he saw Huckster, he gave a sort of gasp, and turning sharply to the left began to run. "'Stop! Thief!' cried Huckster, and set off after him. Mr Huckster's sensations were vivid but brief. He saw the man just before him and spurting briskly for the church corner and the hill road. He saw the village flags and festivities beyond, and a face or so turned towards him. He bawled, Stop! again. He had hardly gone ten strides before his shin was caught in some mysterious fashion, and he was no longer running, but flying with inconceivable rapidity through the air. 
He saw the ground suddenly close to his face. The world seemed to splash into a million whirling specks of light, and subsequent proceedings interested him no more. And welcome back. I hope you enjoyed listening to part two of The Invisible Man by H.G. Wells. If you want to head over to my Patreon page, you will see that I have now uploaded my latest offering exclusively for my patrons, The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. I do regular stories and classic poems just for my patrons, so if you're interested in that or just want to support The Well Told Tale, please do consider visiting patreon.com slash thewelltoldtale. There's a link in the description. That's all for this time. I'll be back next week with part three of The Invisible Man. I hope you can join me.